Okay, so uh, in 2012, uh, I got involved in a greenfield project in the e-commerce space. And uh, with a colleague, we decided to uh, write one of the course system uh, of our architecture enclosure. Looking back, so roughly three years later, I can absolutely say that uh, was one of the most postponed technical decisions uh, I've made in my career. Both from a, a business value that we've been able to deliver using closure, but as well as a personal growth. So for me, for my colleagues, and for all the other people that joined the, the project along the way. So let's do a step back and go back in, uh, in 2012. Uh, I work for Uswitch. Uswitch is a press comparison website based in London. A press comparison website is a, is a website where people can go and look for, for better deals for a different for a range of products. So you're looking for a better deals for your uh, utilities bills, or for your insurance, or for your um, mobile contract. So you go there, you give enough information for us to go and try to figure out what's the right deal for you, and then we present you uh, a set of options, right? Can be 10, can be 20, can be 50, depends from the product. And um, back in 2012, we decide to uh, build a new product. Actually, we decide to get, as an as a, as organization, into the insurance space. So Uswitch is uh, very well known in UK for uh, in the utility space, gas electricity, but not so big into um, in insurance. At the time, we decided, okay, let's, 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 let's go into that space. So we decided to start doing a car insurance uh, comparison website. And we start with a, with a very lean team. We, we like to work with lean teams. So I think that it was hard to get leaner than that at the beginning. There were two developers and one operational PPC person. That's how we started. And um, the two developers, and uh, one was me, were uh, both with a, a wealth of experience. We took about 10, 15 years of experience each uh, over a, a variety of domains. Uh, together, we've been working on uh, uh, e-commerce before. We've been working on, uh, on the finance space, high frequency trading as well. Uh, we've been working on telecommunications, we've been consulting. So we've seen a few things. And both uh, were Polygos developers already. So at the time we already got through the process, say, moving from one language to another. Um, for me at the time, I've been already working uh, and having system in production in Java, C Sharp, C, uh, JavaScript to a fairly large degree, uh, both server side and client side, uh, Ruby, you know. So there was a, there was a bit of thing, you know. We 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 knew our stuff. We we believed that we could go through this process, uh, and we're comfortable in the process. But none of the two had any functional programming experience, not at all. I personally had, sure, uh, I, some experience or languages that are like a hybrid, like. JavaScript you can treat as a functional language. The degree of Ruby has some functional construct, but no one had a pure functional language experience. So this is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the experience of this team, with this, these two people, and what we found, the kind of challenges we had, but also the epiphanies that we had along the way. Um, so if we look at the product, if we simplify, this is how like a, a comparison, a current comparison website looks like. You have a website that is collecting information. Uh, where do you live? Uh, how many years are you driving? What's your car? And so on. And then you have something that has to talk with uh, the, the outside world. Because the moment I have all the information, I need to talk with uh, several insurances or brokers and say, hey, for this profile, can you give me your best deal, please? And in real time, present it back to you. right? So you can say, oh, this is very good for me. I want to I wanna buy this one. So. We have the website getting some stuff. We send something with JSON to this thing that we call aggregator because actually it's aggregating multiple information from the different insurers. Each insurer is most of the time via XML. Uh, sadly, some are also SOAP and, and all that kind of stuff. But overall, we're going to expect an XML to get in, say, OK, this is the profile. And we're going to send back in real time uh, an XML with a response. Now, this component here has to say, OK, I have all the different responses. I need to aggregate on something that I understand. And I send it back to, to my website, where I have several premiums, right? When I say several, we're talking about maybe 30 to 40 different integrations. Each one can return either one or multiple brands. So at the end, you present, ideally, 
at least 70 options, right, to the, to the end user, so people can make a, a, a balanced decision. So this is what we're trying to build. And um, for the website, we went for Rails. Um, not because I'm an, an insane fan of Rails, but uh, it definitely sits in the it just works space for, for web stuff. So there's a lot of support out for doing web, web, web work. Uh, it's, a, it's an industry where you can have a lot of talented people to work in the space, so we say, okay, let, let's, let's go for Rails. But for the second bit, the one that we had to go and talk with all the different insurers, this is where we decided to go for closure. Okay, so the question is, why we decide to go for closure there? And there are a couple of, couple of reasons that help us taking a decision. One is that the problem we tried to solve was this transformation. You have one JSON coming off, at least one representational information from the website. You need to transform on and XMLs to talk with the different endpoints. So you transform from a one representation to something else. And then you, have rece you receive back a different data structure that you have to normalize aggregate. For our understanding at the time, that was probably a good, th a, good, a good fit. Let's not forget that also all this is kind of naturally mutable, right? Because we don't, wanna we don't need to change at all the the data structures at the point. We just need to take it, take it and aggregate and reduce them. So that was also for us was, okay, uh, by nature, the closure to support immutable structures sounds something very reasonable. Um, we knew we were talking about a fairly mature stack, mostly because it's running on JVM. That's probably one of the best virtual machines you can work on. It's not the best to a certain degree, but you know, it's, it's a very solid virtual machine. Um, you have repos. So, um, Closure, the Closure community has been able to take something good out of Maven that is not easy by itself, but we've actually been able to use Maven for what it's good at. There is a repository. So you can say, hey, I want that jar from that repository and that version, give it to me. Ignore everything else, right? So you have a solid structure to build and, and, and create your, product, uh, your project. And because ja Closure has uh, Java interoperability, so you can easily step into uh, Java libraries you know that you have a lot of libraries around. So a lot of libraries are not good, but there are gonna be a lot of things that if you need, you have it for free. Some of it already have a closure wrapper. Some you can just go one level down and just use straight away the Java library. If you wanna do something good for the community and there's no wrapper, you write your closure wrapper and the community will love you. But we know that we had a lot of stuff, you know, ready for be used. Um, the language was, you. Uh, had a huge growth potential. So we look at 2012, 2012, so we're talking about three years ago. And already at the time, it was clear that the language wasn't complete. It wasn't done. It was a very complete language already, but there was more to go. Because it was clear from the Closure community that uh, there was a lot of work into the space. You know, the, the language was the, keep growing, adding useful features. Um, it is a nice feeling, right? It's a feeling that you know that over time, uh, new challenges will arise and the community will, will support it, right? There's gonna be new core libraries, new functions, or a better abstraction. And at the same time, we knew that we were gonna have a lot of strong support in the organization. So Uswitch has been one, probably, the, uh, probably one of the first uh, companies to deploy, definitely Europe, I guess, to deploy some closure in production. So we had the very first closure code in production already probably at the end of 2010, 2011. So we knew that there was something that for us was new or not clear. We had a lot of smart people around us in other teams to go and, you know, and pick their brain for, for half a day, for a day, for, for a week. So that's a nice feeling to have. So with all these things in mind, say let's do it. So we start. Line your aggregator. So line again is a is a, a nice tool in the closure space that is like a project automation tool and you do this, bang, you have a new project with all the folders and a bit of support. Very easy. So a lot of excitement. We started, but first challenge, Emacs. So you go into Lisp because closure is a Lisp. And the people in, 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 in the Lisp space will say, well, it's Lisp. Emacs is the tool. All right, so I've never personally been big in, in, with Emacs, VI, Vim, so I'm not the right person, but you listen to people with experience, okay, 
you know, you can personalize it, you can run your macro, brilliant. But the learning curve is steep, insanely steep. Even two, three years later, I know enough to move around, but definitely I'm not at a level where I, I can make crazy things in Emacs. The beauty of Emacs is you can do crazy things if you want, but you have to be ready for a very steep learning curve. So this, for me, is a space where there's a lot of uh, potential innovation because some people love Emacs and they just go for it. Some people love Vim, so they use Emacs in evil mode that is actually allowing you to use the Vim uh, key binding, all right? There are some plugins, there's a cursor plugin for IntelliJ that's trying to give you a bit more support. Um, I personally haven't found yet something that gave the total happiness. I'm looking for it. Uh, from time to time, I try different things. Sometimes I go even more. Sometimes I go to IntelliJ plus Cursive. Then I go back to Emacs. But this definitely has been a very first big challenge for us. All right. Well, um, we learn enough, and let's do more. But immediately we had a second challenge: reading Lisp. So, as I said, when uh, when we started this project, I've been already working with uh, professional level six to seven different languages. So. To her, overall, I was feeling quite comfortable. It's not the problem of picking a new syntax. But then you find this thing in front of you, and the first line is just defining a vector where you have uh, a bunch of maps, a hashes with just a value, brilliant. And then you have that thing down where you mostly try to say, all right, I have a vector. I want to filter for everything where the value is smaller than 20. Then I map on the val because the val can be a function, so I can map over it. Then I reduce, and then I multiply super two. Now this is like a silly example, but the point is, it was taking me a lot of time. I was seeing code, I was seeing examples, I was looking at other pro project, but it was taking a lot of time to actually grow the language to understand what's happening. Uh, someone this morning was talking about the parentheses. That is definitely not a challenge. For the very first period, it sounds very silly, but all these parentheses are a bit overwhelming. After a while, you, you know, you, I, I got used to that, and you get used to that, and you have tools that support, like Emacs Parity Mode, so that it doesn't allow you to go with uh, unbalanced parentheses. You have Rainbow Mode, so it try to give the color matching, so it helps you visually to get it. But definitely, if you go into this space, it's a challenge. When you got it, you're right. You don't see the parentheses anymore. You know, you, your brain uh, knows how to see it, but the first couple of weeks and, and the months, between Emacs and this, I felt a bit clueless. I felt that my productivity was very challenging. Say, this is hard, man. This is very hard. But, you know, all suddenly then we had the very first epiphany. So we had all the code, and it was hard. But then we started understanding the beauty of the language. And, uh, the first thing, the first epiphany we realized is that uh, Clojure has a concept of a threading macro, that is the arrow, the double arrow there, that allows you to model code like a local pipeline. So there are a couple of variations. You have the one with a single arrow, the one with a double arrow, and a couple of others, but it doesn't matter for the specific. So what happens? We, we had this. And the threading macro allow you to take uh, an expression, the vector, and thread it over uh, a bunch of forms. That means that I can do something like this, right? I take the vector, I pass it to the filter, the result of this will pass to my map, so I have all the val, the result will be reduced, and then I multiply. That was brilliant. That was brilliant, one, because at the beginning it was helping us a lot of making Lisp sane for us that were new into the Lisp space. But the other thing is that you actually have a visual representation of what is a pipeline. Most of the thing we do uh, as a software engineer is moving data over a pipeline. You take something, you, you, you reduce, you take something more, you merge with something else, and so on. Having something that even visually allow you to define the pipeline for us has been amazing. Um, so this has been a, an amazing for discovery. And all suddenly all the code was having 30 macros all over the place. Uh, even too much, then we had to understand when it was in need of a, of a 30 macro, but that has been a massive improvement. That was epiphany number one. At, when we understood that, we start smiling. You understand quite very quickly, so it's not that. Um, 
But then we had a third, a third challenge. So we, now we're writing code. We're writing closure code. Okay, we have the threading macros. This is helping us a lot. We have a better Emacs understanding. Okay, we can read it, our Lisp a bit better. But we felt we're still struggling to write idiomatic closure. There was something was missing. And it took a little while for us to understand. It's not that our code was failing. It's not that the code wasn't shorter than other languages. But there was something missing there. And, and what was missing? What was the point? Well, let's take this thing. So we have a vector of maps where you have a name and nationality. So you have a bunch of people, right? Cool. And I want to be able to filter, right? I want to say, I want to take everyone that is not Italian out of this thing, for example. Um, so you can go something like that, right? Just to be very clear. Um, so you can go very heavy on encapsulation. Let's not forget the massive object-oriented background I had, so you know, it's all about encapsulation. And all right, all right, am I not Italian? So I say, well, I take uh, one person in and I filter, I take the nationality and it's not, not good. That means I can write something like this. I'm, I'm fighting with my thing today. So, at the function, I can write for, for truth something with the filter, right? Okay, but this is very heavy, the not Italian, right? The nationality is, is just hidden into the not Italian. What if I want to start filter for other nationalities, for example? So, okay, I go and write a uh, an inline function, right? So closure has comes to the inline function, anonymous function, and most of us say, well, I want to filter still my people, and I just have inline my function. The result is still the same, right? So this is okay, because then I can, that's fine, I can do this. I want to do the same, I just want to do a different filtering, right? But there's a bit of duplication there. We were struggling, right? And because filter will take a function and only an argument, there's, we weren't very sure, you know, we're ending with a lot of anonymous function in our code, or in lines, right? So I think they have an example with an anonymous, but concept is the same. We had a lot of this stuff around us. There's something not okay there. Uh, and then actually we had this, our second epiphany, Funct function composition. Okay, and in particular, we'll, we'll learn about partial. So partial is a function that takes a function and arguments few, that are fewer than what the function f will take. That works on a function itself that you can invoke. When invoked with a certain number of arguments, we'll invoke f with the arg1, and everything has been passed to the partial function. Right? What does it mean? Well, it means I can write better, no? I can write this. I can write a, a not function that takes nationality and the, and the person is encapsulating the behavior by not necessarily a variable, and then I can write this. Partial, not Italian. And that was brilliant, right? That is, is, is simple to a degree. It's, it's also silly from us for not being realizing this before. But um, this allows us to understand that with function composition, we have a ve very dry code because duplication is gone. Very expressive because this is insanely expressive, right? And probably we are getting one step closer uh, to, to what actually the Lisp was telling us, right? That was brilliant. Um, so we, we actually, when we understood that, we actually started understanding what, what working with Lisp really mean. Um, and they start pushing us a bit more, right? We need to understand, for example, that uh, maybe it was time to dedicate a bit more time to really understand the Clojure core library. The core library is not big. It's quite contained. But it's extremely powerful. So of all the other languages that have been working, the core library was sometimes small, sometimes big, but at the same time, it was very on demand, right? It was very clear. Uh, 
the scope of the, of, the, of, the, of the objects and the methods were very well defined, and I can just go there and read the documentation when I had to work with a file, when I had to work with a collection. With Lisp and the closure, we understood, thanks to Parcher, there are a lot of functions there that allow you to do very interesting things when you put them together. So probably we had to spend a little more time or get a bit more deeper in the core library. And this gave us kind of a natural follow-up, our third epiphany, the function of first-class citizens. So this is said, right? This is, you read it, white paper, blog post, it's like second, second statement. But really, when you understand that everything is geared to a functional composition and creation, you actually understood, understand the core of the Lisp enclosure. So partial allow us to open the door in the space. Um, but there are multiple functions, right? You have a complex, exactly a composition of function, you have apply. But mostly what you need to understand and what was for us uh, the final opening the door of how to work with closure was really we need to work with functions, finding the right granularity of each function and combine them, compose them to achieve greater goals. If we find the right granularity, then we're into the game, right? because then function will be combined and composed in a very interesting way. So this is quite interesting as well from a personal growth because um, as developers, as experienced developers, um, the tools are quite interesting, but by naturally that having to think about function composition is taking back into the game a bunch of, uh, of pure computer science concept that for a, for a certain bunch of reasons are hidden into uh, object-oriented space. You know, all of a sudden you realize that all those things that were coming out during uh, uh, university years, there's actually a use case for that. It's not sitting in like uh, compiled writing, right? So from a personal perspective, from a personal growth perspective, it allows you to think a bit better what sometimes you started and understand actually some internals quite well. Um, we were quite sold by, by, by then, you know. We actually understood at this time that the, the language is powerful and it was actually adding a lot of value. But we had something else. Um, that is, we're talking about parallelism now. So uh, as I said at the beginning, what we have to do once we have a user profile is talking with about 30 different integrations, right? So we transform the same data structure in, in 30 different XMLs. And each one will take anything between a second to six, seven seconds to give us a response back. Now, if you imagine 30 integration, six seconds uh, each, is something that you cannot do sequentially. No one will wait three minutes to see uh, a web page, right? With uh, anything to, to compare. People will go away. So sequential approach was a no-go. You naturally have to work with uh, parallelism. You naturally have to fire this request in parallel as much as you can and then reduce back. So what does it mean? Let's imagine that we have a, a vector of functions. So each function in this vector knows how to talk with an integration, right? Let's know the, the internal details. It just knows how to build XML, file a request, get a response, and give you back something back, right? Each one knows. And we know that we have this, this big vector. There's only three, but that should be probably 30 or 40. We have to do each one. And we need to do in, go in parallel, right? Because, again, sequential is no go. Well, Clojure has a bunch of macros and, and functions that are built in to make this extremely simple. A um, first one is a pmap. So we're probably all comfortable with, a, with map, right? That is applying a function over a collection of a sequence. pmap is like it's a parallel brother, right? What it's doing is applying the function in parallel. Uh, it's hardware bound, so it will run in parallel based on the number of processors you're running on plus two, right? So there's a, you know, you can discuss about how much you're, you're bound there, but it's already an improvement, right? So sequential is no go, what options we have? First one is let's p map. Works well until you don't have many. But it's always good to know, for example, that if you decide to, to scale up, 
that will scale with you, right? If I go on my AWS and increase the size on my, on my machines, this will scale with me. More processors, more parallelism. Brilliant. This is just core library. Eh? This is not, there's no more stuff to, to pull in. It's just there, just there to be used, waiting you for to be, to be used. So that wasn't bad. But then Clojure gives you a little more. You can create futures like that. So we have our usual vector of functions. And what I can do is a map over the vector. And each one will be running a future. The future will run the block, the function, in a thread. Return me the future. There will be no blocking. Only when I resolve the future, then it's be blocking, will be blocking, right? So the map will very quickly go through the vector and automatically fire and thread one pair function. So mostly with one line, I'm firing all these in parallel. So that is not, uh, that is an unbound, right? The threads are coming from a thread pool and is unbounded. So there's a risk that you're eating out all the thread, but it, you know, a JVM can handle quite a good number of threads. So unless you're firing hundreds and hundreds, that's not a concern, right? So this, in one line, boom, all the function, all the integration in parallel are running, right? So in that case, if you simplify, you, believe, you say that every integration will take about five seconds to come back, right? In five seconds, you're gonna have all the results. That's brilliant. It took us nothing more than one function. Again, core library, nothing more. No more dependency, it's not a work from someone that you know, had to solve, this is just coming with closure. I appreciate that some other languages have this construct, right? But um, especially the object-oriented world is a bit more uh, complicated. So this was really brilliant. But then, I said it was 2012, around 2013, Rich Hickey decided to help us even more and release CoraSync. So CoraSync is built from the Clojure uh, core team, but exactly delivered as a separate library, despite its core, is a separate jar. But CoraSync is introducing the concept of channels, nicely taken uh, borrow from the Go language, if someone is into Go, it's the same. Richie say very clearly, say that was a good idea, we decided to do it. And, and actually introducing asynchronous programming into the closure world. Okay, so first, we just pim up. Second iteration is, well, I just fire a thread, the thread will wait for a response, and then everything, I, I resolve the future, and I'll have all information back. Third iteration is a sync, a synchronous programming, even better utilization of my thread, right? That was brilliant. You know, for us, and this is actually, um, we didn't do the, the PMAP because for us the, uh, the bound on the hardware was a bit uh, too strict, but the type of iteration of, of thinking and development exactly happened, right? We, meant we moved from mapping over our future to core sync, roughly like as soon as it got out. And this is brilliant because again, it's demonstrating how the language is growing with you because uh, the Clojure core team realized there was a need in the space and released something that actually has a massive impact in our productivity. Um, there's a concept also again for uh, uh, enclosure where the old core sync is based on CSP. So it's again, I think it's, it's really based on the, on the mindset of the, of, you know, of the core of our team, but mostly we're adding even more interesting computer science concept on the language. So even more personal growth, right? You want to understand a bit more? There's tons to read and understand. Some of the concepts that are just offered to you just to understand in closure space, what I'm, uh, I'm realizing is that I'm taking those concepts back in other languages, right? Even if we do not have the native concept to do other things, I have a, a better knowledge of some internal or some, or some models and I try to replicate. That is immense, uh, the value is immense. Um, 
that was for us was the, the final selling point. You know, when we realized how easy for us was to do these kind of things, we say, well, yes, the value is there. We don't have to fight to go parallel. We don't have to do anything super complicated. It's just very, very neat. Um, so this is a bit of the, the journey over two years and a half. But really, the, the take for us is that if you're looking for data transformation, closure is an absolutely good option. If you have something you have to transform multiple times, well, closure is extremely terse. I didn't touch much about the data transformation bit, how we move from a JSON to an XML, but it is extremely simple as well. The code we have been able to achieve over time is extremely cold, is extremely terse, but at the same time expressive. And this is for me is one of the beauty. You don't have to do very complicated construct to achieve certain things, right? Um, if you look, I remember when we talk about a threading macro, it's just brilliant. Um, what has been introduced in an object rent uh, the space four or five years ago with all the, the fluid interface thing? Is it not an attempt to model the same thing in the object oriented world? Closure is just there. You don't have to do anything particular. It's a mature ecosystem. JVM works well. The repos are there. The libraries are available. Java and JVM are a, a very good citizen in the Unix space. Um, we personally currently deploy as a, we package in a, you create a Uber jar. It's a single jar with all your application. Um, if it's a web app, we also embed the web server in it. We package a Ubuntu package. And this is how we deploy. Happy to get. Right, so it's, it's a very mature, there's no much hacking around. It's very clear defined, and you can build also a very powerful pipeline. Um, the personal growth is, is massive. It takes you back to computer science concept that you learn and say, what's, what's the value of this? Now finally you see them in action. You go and go back and you write Ruby or, I don't know, I haven't tried with Java for a little while, but maybe Java, now with Java 8, but you, know, you take the same concept back to other languages and you try to apply certain, some of the concepts. Um, so the people, the people grow with the product, right? Um, it's the same concept that you have eight year experience or times one year experience. This actually give you a massive step in your learning. And the business, the business impact we had, uh, the functional composition and the parallelism that we just discussed, it gave us a competitive advantage. We didn't do, have to do anything complicated to talk with 30 integration at the time. We didn't do anything too complicated to, know, to avoid repetition. It's just about when we, we understood the core libraries, that was there for us. Any question? So the, qu the question is why we pick Clojure and not another functional programming language. Um, no, we didn't do any comparison. Uh, I think that on the specific uh, of Clojure versus another uh, functional language was the internal support. Because we had other people that were already on a journey of learning Clojure, and we thought that uh, it was easy to have someone to have interesting conversation right in the starting uh, uh, doing in Haskell, for example, and be by ourselves. I cannot compare, it was getting better or worse with Haskell because I haven't tried, but that, that for us was when we understood that probably the functional program, uh, programming paradigm was the right fit for the type of problems, then it would say, well, we have a lot of smart people, closure knowledge sitting around, let's do that. Any other question?
extended the, the, the defense because of, um, yeah. why is it? Yeah. So, so the, the, the question is, what was the difference between our PMAP implementation and the map with futures? Um, you can take the code back. I think is. Uh, we are looking here. Right. The, the, the main difference is purely that PMAP is hardware bound. So you're going to run. So PMAP behind the scene is running your the function in parallel up to the number of processors you have plus two. So let's say that you're running a quad processor machine and you have eight functions that you want to run. Yeah? You're going to be able to run up to six functions in parallel. So PMAP will say, all right, I can run six in parallel. So it will fire behind the scene six threads, right? But the other two are waiting for our two threads to be free, right? So from a for your parallelism attempt, you're going to have to wait for the slowest of the first block, right? Because you're going to be blocked for the slowest. Well, no, actually, the fastest one in this case will be the first one to free. At that point, you can tackle that the next one, right? So that's the problem with Pima. It's not a problem, it's just the implementation. You can hack it, but. Um, the second one, because it's not, is unbounded, right? The, the, fee, the, the thread coming from the future are coming from a thread pool that is unbounded. So there's no limit. Potentially, you can, f you can fire as many as you want, and then you'll probably kill your JVM if you fire, I don't know how many hundreds, but you, you don't have the problem. So in this specific, you have four, these four will run in parallel. You're in a, qu uh, in a, in a quad processor machines, so you can, you know, we said four plus two. If you have four, no problem. If you have six, still no problem. If you have eight, PMAP will take longer because he has to wait for two, two to finish to pick the next two. With future, all six will start in parallel. Yeah? Absolutely. It's an unbounded thread pool. Right, so the values that can, it's up to you to decide when too much is too much. Right, you can fire as much as you want. Did I, is it clear? Yeah. Yeah, good. Any, any other question? No? Cool. Thank you.